Are you, uh, hopefully the teams are ready to enter Antlion Pit and compete. Um, we, just a little bit of background on this uh, because it has an unusual background. The inaugural event of Antlion Pit was in, at the annual meeting in 2019 in St. Louis and it was a wonderful inaugural event with uh, at least 100 people in the audience and six teams presenting and um, encouraged us to, to do it the next year. But the next year, of course, was 2020. And uh, COVID really dealt a number on uh, Antlion Pit. And um, unfortunately, uh, we haven't been able to do it again until 2023, Entomology 2023. So here we are at National Harbor and having the competition again. And for those of you who don't know, Antlion Pit is kind of designed for innovative ideas from our ESA community to really um, ex express innovation and to, to, th to think very creatively about not only new products, but also just uh, ideas, ideation, events, um, new ways of doing things, and to kind of capture that in a pitch competition, sort of loosely, kind of, sort of, modeled after Shark Tank. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the genesis uh, of this. So um, we're doing it again this year, and hopefully it'll be a, a great success. And, um, and so before we get on with the competition, I want to introduce the, the judges. Um, oh, first, though, um, I'm Bob Peterson, and uh, I'm seeing the event this year. And also want to definitely recognize uh, Patty Prasivka, who is helping uh, as, um, as a co-organizer with me and also will be taking uh, uh, audience questions and, and that kind of thing. Um, and you'll see on the slides uh, how that will be done as, as, as we go here. So want to introduce our judges. And this time we're having them sit on the, uh, uh, at a, a table on the stage. And our, our judges this year, uh, Michelle Smith from Corteva, Nan Yao Su, University of Florida, and Tanner Matson, who four years ago was runner up in this competition. And I think you're now at the Smithsonian That's right. um, Museum of Natural History, Natural History. And so those are our judges for today. And so now I wanna go over the rules so everyone uh, knows the rules and then we'll get on with the, uh, on with the competition. So, um, each team will have five minutes for their presentation and eight minutes for judges and audience questions. And we'll show uh, how to do the audience thing here in a minute. Um, and so we're going to do uh, five minutes of questions from the judges and then three minutes of questions from the audience. So it's going to be six presentations are going to go kind of uh, hopefully on time and, and, and relatively quickly. So... I guess we're going to have a, a voice intro for the first. Um, do we want to say anything about the audience questions? Yeah, you've got a mic, Pat. I do have a mic. Um, is the code going to come up in between? OK, yeah, there'll oh. be a QR code to scan. Uh, keep those questions in your mind, but there'll be a QR code to scan a Slido, and you can type in your questions. If you see a question you like and you want that one answered, you can uh, vote it up, and uh, hopefully we'll all work smoothly. If all else fails, um, we'll have this mic, and you can ask it live, but let's hope the technology works, so thanks. Yes, thank you. Ah, there we go, the slide, and thank you for advancing that. Um, and again, thank you all for coming, and stick around at the end because we're going to announce the winner at the end, the winner of the uh, $5,000 award for uh, winning this competition. So thank you all again for coming and let's get on with the, uh, let's get on with Antlion Pit. Please welcome to the stage, Elizabeth Bello and Yu Tao Chen from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, presenting Anti-Back Medical Tubing.
Alrighty, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Bellow and this is my partner, Utah. We're from the ABC lab at the University of Illinois. And today, we're gonna talk about a product that has the potential to revolutionize the healthcare industry and fundamentally change the way that we prevent bacterial infections. Before we start talking about that, we need to talk about the problem. So the issue here is healthcare associated infections. These are bacterial infections that are acquired by patients from being treated in clinical settings or in hospitals. Healthcare associated infections uh, are seen over 700,000 cases annually in the United States. They're responsible for more than 75,000 deaths and uh, cost approximately 28 to $33 billion in excess costs. The top three healthcare associated infections are central line bloodstream infections, ventilator associated pneumonia, and catheter associated urinary tract infections, which is what we'll be focusing on today. One important thing to keep in mind is that the commonality between all three of these infections is medical tubing. So catheter associated urinary tract infections uh, comprise more than 30% of these healthcare uh, associated infections and they're responsible for 93,000 cases a year, 13,000 deaths, and approximately 340 to $450 million in excess costs. Shockingly, 50 to 70% of these are preventable. Catheter-associated infections often arise from uh, bacterial growth and colonization that can ultimately lead to biofilm formation. The current preventatives and treatments are pretty limited, so uh, a few of the preventatives are either to remove and replace catheters or avoid, avoid using them altogether, which isn't always possible. It's also uh, costly as well. Another preventative is to use silver or antibiotic infused catheters. And again, this can be costly and increases the risk for the development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, a known nightmare in the medical field. The treatment once a patient does have one of these infections is to use antibiotics, which again can be costly and also increase that risk for antibiotic resistance in uh, bacteria. So what if there was a way to prevent these infections that didn't increase that risk of antibiotic uh, resistance in bacteria? Luckily for us, we can turn to nature for the solution. So cicadas are a perfect example of an insect that have a physical structure that give them unique functionalities. Looking at this image on the right, you can see the nanopillars on a cicada wing. Uh, there are typically thousands of these that cover the wing and they turn the wing into a uh, super hydrophobic material, meaning they're very waterproof and also antimicrobial. On that same image, you can see a pseudomonas bacteria that's actually been destroyed and killed by these nanopillars. So using this as inspiration, um, excuse me. So uh, the, the super hydrophobic function also allows uh, those germs and particles to be carried away from the surface in these uh, droplets that are suspended on their wings. So using this as inspiration, we'd like to introduce our prototype design, which is antibac medical tubing. In essence, what we'd like to do is replicate these nanostructures and incorporate them into different types of polymer materials and tubing. So Utah is currently heading this research project and she is working on fabricating nanotextured polystyrene surfaces. The image on the left here, you can see intact pseudomonas bacteria on a smooth polystyrene surface. So they're, they're fully alive, they're doing okay, which is not what we want in our catheter tubings. The image in the middle and the image on the right are two of the nanotextured uh, surfaces that Utah has fabricated in the lab and uh, she's actually able to modify the height and width of these nanopillars to optimize the system. Circled in red, you could see bacteria that is killed in both instances. And our preliminary results are showing that our engineered surfaces are just as effective at killing bacteria as cicada wings, which have a 95% success rate at killing bacteria, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. She's also working on microfluidics testing to look at bacterial adhesion. Uh, so once the bacteria infiltrates a system, it can adhere, and then that's what causes the colonization and uh, starts that biofilm process. So she's looking at this to study how those bacteria are adhering in systems where water or other fluids are flowing across the surface. So overall, our goal is to develop a nanostructured catheter tubing that prevents bacterial infection and reduces the resistance of antibiotic, uh, reduces the, the risk of uh, developing antibiotic resistance. But we need 
your help. So our product has the potential to reduce catheter-associated infection rates, reduce labor costs, save thousands of lives, and save millions of dollars in excess costs. It has the potential for a far-reaching impact. We can incorporate this into other types of structures. And it's time that our healthcare shifts its focus from reactive care to proactive care. With your venture capital, we plan on determining the bacterial mechanism, the bactericidal mechanism of nanopillars, investigating the antimicrobial effects of our nanotextured polymers and tubings, and also to continue the microfluidics testing. Thank you for your time. Okay, well, we'll start our five minutes of questions from the judges, so the judges can feel free to ask any questions they like right now, if they have some. I'll start. Obviously, entomologists are not the customers that you're looking at here. So who, who would your commercialization partners be? Have you identified uh, who, who they would be to commercialize this product? This product can be used in many different fields, uh, including food science, uh, food industries, to keep the food fresh for longer times. It can also be medical devices. It can be incorporated in many, many different kind of products. So one thing to start with could be um, medical companies, which specifically catheter production, <laughs> uh, that we are actually just looking at it. And then perhaps we can work with them and then hopefully produce something that can go through the clinical trials and eventually become a product that can benefit people's lives. Thank you. Yeah, I have a similar question because this is basically a medical device. It mean that you need uh, FDA approval, meaning that you have a large-scale large clinical trial needed. You need a lot of capital. You're competing with a big pharma company. So how are you going to get that kind of resource to do that? So uh, we realized that ultimately the entire length of the project is a multi-million dollar project. Um, but we feel that obviously every cent counts. And in order to make this uh, a product that can go through clinical trials, we need to do that fundamental research and understand exactly how the mechanisms work in nature so that we can replicate it or optimize it uh, so that it, uh, it, it works the way that we intended to. Also, I'm planning to do microfluidic testing, which is, an, which is like I'm trying to set up the experiment right now. And that's actually a very dynamic process to test uh, the bacteria colonization on surfaces. Because usually when I do, um, when, actually when most research nowadays do antibacterial testing, they mostly focus on, for example, confocal imaging or SEM imaging. But that's actually a very static way to test the efficiency of these surfaces. And sometimes the data may not, may not actually be the same for a dynamic environment when you actually flow liquid through the surfaces and observe how bacteria eventually colonize and grow biofilm and to measure all of these parameters, uh, yeah, I would very much like to continue microflood testing. <laughs> so speaking of testing in your, in your pitch here, you said that the nanostructure was compared to cicada wings with similar efficacy, but wouldn't the more apt comparison be to the antibiotic uh, treated linings or the silver lined uh, catheter tubes and how does your nanostructure compare to that in terms of effect? Efficacy? Yes, for sure. Um, we're actually talking about in the lab that I have an undergrad that can start uh, getting testing the antibiotic resistant part and also the other kind of tubing to see how their efficacy is and to compare it with our products. Judges, there are some questions from the audience, but if you have one's follow-up or feel free to signal to me and we can always take yours in priority, but if you want me to start some of these. Um, what is the estimated cost per one tube? Uh, we do not currently have an estimated cost for one tube because we are still working on the, the fabrication process in the lab. Um, Utah, do you have any idea of the, the fabrication cost for the, the project that you're working on currently? We're currently working with polystyrene structures. Yeah, I'm uh, currently working with polystyrene, but um, I can other use other polymers because my process is 
uh, I use nano imprinting lithogra lithography, which is a material science technique that's recently been developed and um, a lot of people are using it. So this technique allows me to experiment with other kind of polymers as well. So my hope is that uh, perhaps we can try other polymers and see if we can cut down the cost in the long run and if we can modify the process and reduce the cost. Uh, would there be, with the nanopillars, increased friction in the tube um, while in the patient potentially cause discomfort or irritation? So because of the nanopillar scale, uh, they're about 350 nanometers in height and 150 nanometers in width. These are extremely, extremely small. So if you were to feel a catheter tube and you were to feel a catheter tube that has this nanostructuring, you wouldn't be able to tangibly uh, or tactilely feel that difference. Um, we do plan on, though, once we have all of our fundamental research done, we do plan on looking at friction and how the nanostructure uh, might affect other biological particles like blood cells and things like that. So it's definitely a, a something that we're interested in looking at, and we know that it, it could potentially be a concern. Are there concerns with introducing microplastics into the body? No. <laughs> there. Okay. I mean, it is, it is a polymer tubing that's going into the body, so it. it I mean, yes, it's it's plastic that's going in the body, but there is, you know, currently in the medical field, many types of plastics and other polymers that are being introduced into the body. Um, is the material synthetic with similar structure or is it the same as the wing? Could you repeat the question? Is the material synthetic with similar structure or is it the same as the wing? So it's somewhat different, but since we're talking about mostly um, when the wings kill bacteria and when my engineer products kill bacteria, they are both using the mechanical forces. So at the end of the day, even though chemistry matters, but it does not matter too much in this case. And uh, I think for uh, cicada wings, it definitely has some fatty acids on it to improve the hydrophobicity. But we can also do that through chemical like uh, moderation to our own surfaces to improve the hydrophobicity and to achieve the same goal as the cicada wing. Is there any evidence that bacteria might develop a structural resistance to the microtubing due to the 95% efficacy? I don't think so. I, I can also expand if we still have time. So, there, yeah, sure. There, there are three different mechanisms that have been proposed how bacteria is killed by these nanopillars. One of them is that the bacteria is sinking into the structures due to gravity, and the bacteria membrane becomes uh, poked by the nanopillars and eventually the bacteria cell <laughs> ruptures. <laughs> uh, it also can be that the bacteria cell membrane is, uh, is being stretched. So you can think of a latex glove. When you're stretching it, it becomes thinner and thinner and eventually breaks. So that can be another kind of mechanism. Uh, the third one is that the bacteria is moving on the surface and as it's moving, it gets sheared by the nanopillars. So that's the third one. And personally, I think it's a combination of all of those mechanisms that contribute to cell death. So, yes, that, so I, it's mostly mechanical forces. Okay. I think we just have a, a couple seconds left. So any other additional questions or follow-up from the judges? Just follow up on that question, right? In your demonstration, you use a little soft stuff there. You kind of smoosh it, eventually it's gonna break. In reality, what moved the bacteria in such a way they would break themselves? Isn't an organism would walk on any surface would not move in such a way to break themselves? Right. Uh, so one thing is that I think for cicada wing specifically, uh, the fatty acids and the bacterial membrane, there are some interactions there because there are fatty acids and the bacterial membrane also has some other comp components. And then uh, there's an adhesion force going on there. And I think I also observed a nanopillar being bent when the bacteria is sinking into the structures. I think there's also some capillary forces. So, you know, when things get down to nanostructures, uh, it's very interesting. The phenomena are quite different when compared to like things that, you know, we observe every day. Uh, when it's very small scaled, a lot of physics counter into that. So I think capillary forces is definitely one thing that may have uh, contributed to bacteria being kind of adhered to the surface and eventually just start being poked. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Um, we will give the judges a little time to confer amongst themselves with their judging criteria. The next team up.
if you know who you are, <laughs> um, or we'll find out. Um, can you come up and set up anything at this time? Please welcome to the stage Sonia Michaluk from Carnegie Mellon University, presenting GEMS, Genetics Entomological Monitoring Station. Hello, I'm Sonia Michaluk, and today I'm going to talk to you about GEMS. GEMS or Genetics Monitoring Oops, sorry. GEMS, or Genetics Entomological Monitoring Station, is a lab extension that enables accessible DNA barcoding of insects. Um, sorry. Uh, DNA barcoding is extracting and amplifying DNA from an organism in order to identify and get valuable taxonomic information. With a cost of less than $10,000, GEMS is ideal for educational uses and for citizen science, for community science centers with citizen science programs, and for research. I have worked with many of these such organizations, and I really feel that GEMS is a resource that can help gather more data um, and help to uh, add another level 
um, to existing programs and also helped start up water monitoring programs and environmental monitoring programs. Um, so uh, currently, um, the concept of GEMS is established, um, but I would like to make GEMS even more accessible by creating a web application. Um, but first, here are some more uses of GEMS. It can be used to track threatened, endangered, invasive, and novel species. It can be used to educate students about genetics fundamentals and also entomology. Um, it provides an in-house capability for specimen identification. Uh, but my focus with it um, and most of my background is with freshwater uh, ecosystem bioassessment. Freshwater bioassessment uses aquatic macroinvertebrates whose presence tell us um, about the cumulative effects of stressors on an ecosystem. By gathering this data, we can make informed decisions regarding land use and help to conserve natural resources as well as protect sensitive species. Freshwater bioassessment uses something called the biotic index, which is a score from zero to 10, which reflects how sensitive an organism is to pollution. So GEMS bridges DNA barcoding and bioassessment, which is really the first of its kind. And current bioassessment methods that have been in use since the 1970s, they typically identify organisms down to the order or family level. But with GEMS, you get much higher taxonomic resolution. GEMS can also be used to create new bioassessment methods. So I use GEMS to create a new bioassessment method using larval chironomidae. And chironomidae do an excellent job of showing the importance of identifying these organisms past the family level. They have a biotic index um, for the family of six, but that masks the underlying variants from zero to 10 that are the biotic indices that make up the genera of this family. Um, they fill a variety of ecological niches and they barcode exceedingly well. And then there's also a significance to focusing on this one family. Um, uh, focusing on this one family is very helpful uh, because it can reduce primer bias and further optimize this process. So what has been achieved? Um, through years of trial and error, protocols, low cost, min, um, small scale equipment has been optimized and recorded in the GEMS extension playbook, um, which goes step by step to show how to set up and establish a GEMS lab. It has curriculums for educational uses and all of, um, everything has been refined for making it very easy and very low cost. Uh, GEMS has also been used to help conserve over 153 acres of wetlands in um, urban New Jersey and develop the Chironomid method. So what's next? GEMS has low visibility. Um, if you want the materials, it's always been like, well, email me. Um, GEMS also needs streamlining. To use it for bioassessment, there's many components that must come together from identifying the species using BLAST to getting the biotic index to then using it to calculate a health score. I want to put all of this process in one place. This web application would serve two purposes. Firstly, it would have it would provide all information to establish and to maintain GEMS. Um, it would also have the streamlined pathway from uploading DNA sequences with an API to BLAST, um, being able to get the biotic index, any ecologically relevant information, and then calculate the health of that ecosystem. We need big data in order to make informed decisions regarding land use, development, infrastructure, environmental regulations, and you know, we can't always have a room of about a dozen volunteers identifying samples um, using uh, manual, identif manual identification by morphology. I believe we need more throughput, we need more resolution, um, and GEMS can do just that. Oh, uh, thank you. Hey judges, uh, are welcome to start with their questions. Um, you want to do it? Go for it. So, what is the final product you try to produce, and then what is the market value of that? Um, so, to answer the first question, the final product of GEMS and its current state is it's a playbook, a recipe book for how to create this lab extension. It has all of the equipment, details from like how to store the reagents, um, procedures that have been refined to work with insects. The target audience is really um, for education and citizen science uses. So something that it's not gonna be someone with a strong entomological background, but something that is, is very accessible. Um, so that's the current state. I would like to make this web app to make all this information well organized and free and open to the public for people to use. But the web app would also have the, um, the automized process to 
really streamline that process of using it in bioassessment. Um, I am a member of the Society for Freshwater Science, have been for about 10 years, and I've seen these methodologies using genetics you know, start to pop up, but it's yet to really be blended together with bioassessment, um, incorporated into existing procedures. And I believe by, by taking something like DNA barcoding and adding it to these existing procedures, there's, there's already hundreds if not thousands of citizen science programs where people go out and they collect these insects and they bring them back and they identify them um, to get insight on the ecosystems around them. Um, these existing systems can be augmented with GEMS um, and allow for these organisms to be identified further by the same volunteers and citizen scientists and students that are already doing it. So what do you foresee the market value? It's free. Hmm? I mean, money-wise. If I want to invest you, say, $100,000 for your invention, what do I expect to get it back? Um, I've always considered it more of a resource that would be, I wasn't planning on charging any money for it, kind of having it as a free web app that can be accessed online and would kind of just, that anyone could use. I have a question related to um, existing online. And mm -hmm. um, once you've launched the web app, what's your plan to sustain it? Um, so. My, what I would do with the funding is, so I have experience in computer programming and have created similar things and similar projects before. Um, but the funding would go to hiring a web designer because I don't know JavaScript or HTML. Um, and someone that I could work with and create this project with. Um, and from then on, I would plan to maintain it personally. So I saw your prototype kit, but have you, you know, prototyped your market in terms of have you gone into schools and, and given presentations and have classes use this and that kind of thing? I'm um, sorry, it was a little tricky to hear you. Um, uh, sorry, I'll talk louder. Um, have you gone into schools or yes. uh, uh, let's see, groups, biodiversity groups or, you know, clubs, societies and had them use this to do monitoring? I have. Um, so I'm on the board of an environmental conservation organization in New Jersey, and I've had students who work with that test this out. Um, I also have two prototypes in central New Jersey, um, and one of which has had school groups visit um, from local high schools, um, particularly students from AP Biology or AP Environmental Science, and this can also facilitate their learning of entomology and genetics fundamentals, especially when schools don't offer kind of like the traditional wet labs where they learn DNA extraction and PCR. When you've gone into these schools, have they already had experience with other barcoding kits? At that point, no. Thank you. Are we good? Okay, we have um, some questions from the audience. Uh, let's see, a couple of them related to cost. Um, cost for the system, how much does GEM cost, uh, or an estimated cost for the kit? Um, so the estimated cost to set up GEMS is under $10,000. However, with the labs I've already set up, a lot of um, the funding came from grants and a lot of the equipment was actually uh, donated um, from some pharmaceutical companies. Um, so the GEMS lab playbook contains information on how to uh, operate and how to set up the secondhand equipment, how to get secondhand equipment, and also how to solicit funding through grants. Um, and all of those reduce the cost significantly. Um, one of the labs just ended up costing uh, pretty much just the reagents, um, which was funded actually by um, an ESA chrysalis grant. What's the educational threshold needed to work GEMS? Could anyone use it? I like to make it so it's accessible to anyone, um, but traditionally I've seen these types of labs be targeted more towards a, a high school audience or middle school audience. Um, in my experience with uh, citizen science projects, a lot of times the they have like a cutoff range, um, uh, one that I've been a part of, like it was like have to be 14 or older. I'm not sure if this would, this would kind of blend into the existing citizen science projects of organizations. So I, whatever cutoff they have in place would probably stay the same. Um, but it's, will be, or 
The protocols are very clear with pictures and step-by-step -step instructions. Um, it should not be far more difficult than having to sit and identify with a taxonomy book all the macroinvertebrates. Uh, what is the difference between the GEMS and the Oxford nanopore sequencing, such as MINION or MIN-ION? Um, I don't know too much about that, um, but GEMS is meant to really pair with bioassessment. Um, it's really targeted um, to blend into existing protocols to get environmental data um, and to help those protocols become more precise, more accurate, and get higher statistical power. Uh, would the guidebook and app be easily integrated with other ID apps like iNaturalist? Um, I have, I've thought a little bit about iNaturalist, but I kind of see it maybe as a separate thing. Um, the guidebook would be for establishing the lab and the web app would be more for taking in sequences um, as opposed to looking at like photographs of the specimens. But that would be very cool to find a way to integrate it. We have about a minute left. I just want to check with the judges if they had any follow-ups based on questions that have come in. Or something that came to mind. Good. No, you're good? Um, there was just one more that said, is there any use for DNA barcoding? Or, sorry, meta barcoding. DNA meta barcoding. Sorry. Um, so meta barcoding is something that I've looked into a lot when trying to find ways to optimize bioassessment procedures. and I felt, I'm not sure if anyone else has a different opinion on this, but I found it kind of difficult to integrate them into the existing protocols. The way the, uh, this setup works is it, it largely follows the same. You go out into the field, you take a stratified random sample, you, you bring back organisms, and as opposed to identifying them by hand to the family level, they would be, you know, their DNA would be extracted, amplified, and sequenced instead. Um, so I've tried a couple things with meta barcoding, but I haven't quite found a way to make it align in the same way to fill, the, fill this niche. Thank you, we are at time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and as before, if the next team wants to come up to set up prior to the judge, deli judges are deliberating now. Yeah, we'll try to get the QR code up there again. Um, if you scan it one time, it, hopefully it should stay open and you can answer questions or ask questions at any time.
Please welcome to the stage, Dev Merotra, presenting Insect Eavesdropper. Mic check. So, hey ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dev, I'm from UW-Madison, and I'm here to introduce you and the world to the Insect Eavesdropper. Before we begin, I would like to play an audio. Now what you guys are hearing is the sound of a corn root worm chewing at the roots of a corn plant. This was done using the insect eavesdropper, a magical bioacoustic device that uses contact microphones. What we did was we basically plugged this contact microphone on the stem of a corn plant above the first node and we recorded it for an hour and we were able to get the sound of the corn root worm chewing. But why did we do it? Well, the problem with the manual methods are that they're labor intensive, they're money intensive, and they're not able to detect the early stages of insects. And the problem space is a million species, whereas with this device, it's just limited to 20 species that are chewing on the plant. Plus, with increased pesticide usage, they're mounting environmental concerns for proactive pesticide use, and this device brings that down. And plus, this device can detect the detect the life stages of the insect where they're at, so the pesticides can be used more nicely. And that's why this device is here. But how does it actually work? Well, the magic lies in these contact microphones, which are piezoelectric microphones, which detect vibrations, and that's how they're able to pick up the insects. This is connected via USB sound cards to a Raspberry Pi, which basically tells it when to start, when to stop, and where to sell the recordings. And with this setup, we can provide near rapid detection of which species ID it is with up to 96% accuracy in just under 20 seconds. And this beats the competitors since these mics cost $1.50 each and the whole system that we project is about to be $15 per microphone. But how do we know that it actually works? Well, we did a control lab study in which we took two plants, we added insect to the ones, we didn't add insect to the others, we clipped on microphones to both, and then we recorded them in a soundproof room for an hour long each. We tried this out with two big insects, tobacco hornworm and Corrado potato beetle, so we could visually see the insects biting the plant. And then we tested out with very small insects that use a needle to be put on the plant, like European corn borers and northern corn. Root worm. So if you look carefully, the black spikes are from the treatment plant which had the insects and we see no gray spikes because that plant did not have any insects for the device to pick up. So we know this works, but does it work out in the field? Well, we couple this with a trial in a corn field where there was a, where there was a corn field with different varieties of pesticide usage. One of the plots had 100% pesticide, which was the positive control, and one of the plots had no pesticide, which was the negative control, and then we selected one random plot which had varying level of pesticide usage. And just, just a disclaimer, don't put wires in a cornfield. It's horrible. It's horrible. But then we found out that the zero control had no spikes at all, whereas the positive control had spikes. And we validated this by going to the same site again at a different time, and we were still able to see spikes at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. And then we tested a different mic at the same site to see if we were still picking up corn root worm, and we were doing that too. We were picking up signals from mic four at the same site, which was the negative control, which we knew had the corn root worm, and we were also picking up signals from mic one at site one, two. Oops. And after that, we did a NSF regional study where we interviewed farmers and farm consultants who were very interested in the device, but they did not just need species ID to be sure, they also needed the density of the insects to be sure. And that's why we did this control study in a lab where we found out that it only takes 40 seconds for us to be 95% sure that if an insect is on the plant. 
And using those 40 seconds of recorded audio, we can also correlate density of the plants, meaning we can actually figure out how many insects are on a plant by just recording for 40 seconds using this cheap device. So at an estimated cost of just $15 per mic, Insect Eavesdropper offers an affordable alternative to the current solution. The implications of this are worldwide. We can support our farmers by helping them spray less pesticides, contributing to a more sustainable and eco eco-friendly farming future. But this is not possible without you guys and the ESA. We receive feedback from our first prototype, which is capable of detection, insect detection and identification. But wires are very difficult to set in a field, and we need the insect de density for the farm consultants to actually use this device. So we plan to use the funds from the ESA to conduct a density trial run where we plan to you where we plan to use this device take four plants put varying amounts of insects on each and then try to correlate that to the audio sounds so that our prototype can be used by the farm consultants and we can get feedback on it for a more customer feedback centric approach to developing this device and we can also make it wireless which will be the new logo <laughs> and with this i would like to thank our extended team of academic partners the NSF ICOP Foundation, the WARP Foundation, and the Missouri Soybean Checkoff, and my team without this, which none of this would have been possible. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. We will start the judges questioning now. Can we go first? Go ahead, um, Go ahead. One concern perhaps I have is how you could scale this up for practical use in large ag fields? So the question was, how do we scale this up for practical use in uh, farms, let's say, across the nation? Well, there are really two different ways to use this device. One is as part as of, of a kind of a trapping or a sentinel plant monitoring network where we can start interpolating insect trends. Are insects there? Are they not? Are they at threshold? Uh, that could be used across a farm, across a state, or across a region. The second way is actually to run this from someone's phone, where instead of a crop consultant going in and inspecting the field, they could actually just clip the sensor for 20 or 40 seconds on as they're going out and inspecting and get some additional information about insects below ground and boring within the plants or, let's say, the corn ears. Thank you. So I think your data you show us there is based on one single insect? The data was on two separate insects. Uh, but each, each test is one based on one single insect? Uh, so we have a, one insect is being tested at the same time, but all of our machine learning algorithms are across multiple. Okay, so species. if you have a many insects biting at the same time, create a bunch of sound waves that overlap on each other, how are you going to do that? That's a great question. So if there are many insects feeding at the exact same time, uh, first thing that we can do is separate them out by something called their circadian feeding activity. We can start to segregate it out by species the types of insects that are feeding at different types of day. So that's kind of step one. Step two is what amplitude, what, are, what is the actual wavelength that these insects' uh, sound is resonating at. That's kind of screening level part two. Uh, and then screening level part three is if we have some uh, bucket of junk sounds, right, noise that's just a little too garbled, has many insects feeding at exactly the same time, we can actually afford to throw out a lot of that data because we're getting a lot more sounds uh, per insect than we would if we were out just looking and sampling. Just to add to that, we process our samples for machine learning in one second intervals. So an hour long recording is chopped into one second intervals. So an insect biting at the same time at that one second interval is very rare. Because mm -hmm. at one point in time, there should be only one insect. If it's two, we can just disregard that data. Great question, though. Do you have any idea of the limit, um, how small? a feeding organism, um, could you detect a nematode, per, for instance, or how big a plant? That is a great question. So the question was, what are the limits in terms of size of insect? Now, we've tested this with aphids. We've also tested this 
uh, with uh, northern corn rootworms first instar, we, we monitored as they were hatching and we validated that with some malaise trap work within the lab. Um, so we know this can monitor very small insects. We have not tested this with nematodes yet, but we're, uh, we're open to partners in case anyone's studying nematodes here. Um, and what we do not know how large of a plant this can be on. So we have a partner, uh, Rodney Kruber's group out of the USDA Wapato Washington station that's actually testing this on pear and cherry trees because we're just not sure if it will work in that case. Okay. One more. So uh, comparing with what people are doing right now to check the insect damage, how many percent of time do you by using this one, they, they can save, and it, that is provide enough financial incentive for them to buy your product. Yeah. So yeah, I tried this out in the NSF Regional ICOP program. I interviewed like 15 farm consultants and 15 different farmers, and they usually go out to fields like four days a week to check on traps and stuff. This would reduce that time to just going out maybe once a month. So it would have significant time savings and also monetary savings, because they would also be saving time on driving, pesticide usage, and manual labor too. Thank you. Okay, we have some uh, questions from the audience. Um, how durable is the eavesdropper since it will be exposed to the elements in the field? Uh, we ran it on a cornfield for three months during the summer. All of them came back perfectly fine, but we do plan to make this wireless in the future. So it would be a small encasing with a battery inside it or solar, so it would be pretty durable, and this is waterproof too. And I think you addressed about um, overlapping insect noises, but there's several questions about background noise, cars, planes, wind other noises in the field and how you So this mic is a piezoelectric mic, which means if I clip it on my finger right now and I'm speaking, it would not pick that up. But if I'm tapping on my arm, it would pick that up. So that means it only picks up sound when it's vibrating through the solid substrate. So while we tested on the field with corn plants, we did not pick up any tractor sounds, any wind, any environmental factors. It, did, it was affected by rain, but that was droplets falling directly on it. But other than that, non-abiotic sounds were not detected. How many plants in the wild do you need to have an eavesdropper on to guarantee you find insects in that area? So that's a great question. And that's a really a sample size question. So it's the same, uh, it's really hard to answer without a specific species, without a specific field, without a specific crop. Uh, so it's basically, we anticipate the same amount of plants that we're scouting, we would try to clip insect eavesdroppers onto. Uh, however, we're hoping to answer some density questions or uh, how many insects correlate to what number of bite sounds, at which point we can uh, explore some of these spatial dynamics to figure out where and how many uh, insect eavesdroppers would be needed to monitor a specific field. And you mentioned testing on aphids, but there was questions about um, piercing, sucking type insect pests, and uh, how you are, what are you actually, you mentioned bite noise, so what are you actually detecting with those type of insects? Yes, so uh, we were very surprised when we tested on aphids, and it came back in almost a, a straw into a milkshake at the very end of the milkshake into that type of sound. In fact, we have it, uh, we didn't play it at the beginning of this, but come find us after, and we can play that, that sound over here. Um, we also tested this on, actually a partner of ours tested this on, uh, I think it was Ligus linea laris. This was Brian McCornick's group out of Kansas State University. So we are picking up on sucking, piercing sucking sounds. Uh, question about, um, is this designed for the everyday uh, farmer to use? I lost the question now, but I think that was the essence of it, of you know how could it be used by everyday folks? Yeah. So who's, who's the end user? Well, we anticipate two types of end users. One is a farmer or a crop consultant that's going out and scouting the field, and it would be more likely than not that they had this device attached to their phone by a Bluetooth, they went around, walked the field, and clipped it on. 
or alternatively, they could run these as a network uh, and either a, a governmental agency or the wealthier farmers could potentially have a network of these eavesdroppers, which would tell uh, that grower to go out and take an action like scout or treat in those cases. Okay. Lots of great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all, but we are at time unless there's any necessary follow-ups from the judge judges. Thank you very much. We'll try to get those questions to you at a later date and maybe you can address them in the future, but thank you. Thank you so much. We're, we're gonna let the judges take a quick bio break for a minute, so we'll be back in about three minutes. Thank you.
don't be shy. I know you're feeling me because you're giving me the eye, and I don't wanna play around. Baby, watch me move me around. Check this, let's make a scene. Don't leave me waiting room for you wanna make me long for you. Move it, baby, over here so we can set it. Please welcome to the stage Andy Michael and Ashley Leach from The Ohio State University presenting RU43D. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so hopefully at the end of this presentation, we're going to make sure that everybody is going to be for 3D, 3D printing. So our idea came about through some challenges, some frustrations we've had with some extension. And those of you with extension appointments know how difficult it can be to really reach your target audience. A lot of the things we do are, are fact sheets, handouts, these kind of things. And so we give these to growers with good information on that science-backed information. That's what the extension's about. But we all know what happens to this after the meeting, right? They're never going to see that again. And so we lose that effect of, of, of tool development and helping our growers more. Also, for invasive insects, on the slides there, I'm showing pinned insects with spotted lanternfly in Ohio. It's still uh, sampling across Ohio. I can take that to an extension meeting. I can't take the real thing, rightfully so. I'm not, I don't want to contribute to the spread. But I take that to an extension meeting. I pass that around. How many legs do you think are going to be gone? How many wings are going to be gone? So we need better tools to kind of deliver our extension messaging. This is where 3D printing comes in. So one of the things we created is a 3D printed uh, uh, spot and lanternfly keychain representing what an egg mass might look like. And also we're including a tag that QR code links you directly to the Ohio Department of Agriculture reporting site, which is the, the entity that's recording this. And then you all know what you're supposed to do after you find an egg mass, right? After you report it, scrape it off. Well, our keychain is angled on one side, so it's also an egg scraper, too. So if you see spot and lanternfly, you can take care of that. Um, this is uh, a 3D printed uh, soybean leaves that represent different levels of defoliation. Soybean grows, I'm a soybean entomologist, and I always get overestimations of soybean defoliation. This represents 10, 15, 30% defoliation and helps them better gauge um, uh, defoliation so they don't overspray and overestimate defoliation. This is a new pest in soybean gallminge out in Nebraska, Iowa, uh, Minnesota. Um, so there's the picture, and this is our visual representation of a soybean gallminge keychain. This is a tool to look at caterpillar sizing. We know after you get three quarters of an inch or an inch, it's more difficult to control. Well, this is an easier tool that growers can use. Put a caterpillar on this keychain and measure the size. These are beetle butts. As Ashley said, this helps growers identify different types of beetles that they might see in specialty crops. And this has just happened a couple of weeks ago. Elm zigzag sawfly, which also is the cover of the calendar, was found in Ohio a couple of weeks ago. Within a day, we were able to print this leaf and are now handing this throughout Ohio to see and make sure if we can find that. One of the other things we're trying to do is with these tools is also print out life stages. And it's sort of gaining confidence in scouting and training. Because most of us are entomologists here. Once we see that insect or that egg mass for the first time, it's that search image that gets ingrained in your head. Well, you can't do that with invasives, or sometimes the insect is just not there. So what we try to do is to uh, print um, Copy. So this is a western bean cutworm egg mass, and then our 3D printed version is on the other side. We glue that to a corn leaf. This is our version of a stink bug. Uh, this is cereal leaf beetle, and we think we're getting really good because you can tell there's a lady beetle larvae that we think we fooled that is going to try to eat that. And so we also tried spider lanternfly, and Ashley's going to talk about some other things we're adding on to this kind of survey. Yeah, so the question now is we just set up a case for, hey, we need some improvements in extension. So does it work? 
And we're finding that when we use these extension programs that incorporate these 3D prints, we are getting positive feedback. We're getting increases in stakeholder knowledge. And that's what you're seeing right now from those two little heat charts. We're seeing that stakeholders are increasing their knowledge, but not only, we don't want them just to increase their knowledge, we want them to apply that knowledge. And that's what we're seeing in the second part there as well. And so we're incorporating other aspects, including QR codes, Qualtrics surveys. You can scan that right now and go to one of our 3D printed SLF egg mass hunts, and it will start showing you exactly how we do that. And so we're getting positive feedback and this isn't surprising because we're enabling stakeholders to have experiential learning experiences. So we know that adult learners are different. Let's capitalize on that so we can actually move that IPM needle forward. So we've got some really awesome opportunities here to engage stakeholders in different ways. And so when we actually look at the nuts and bolts of this, Andy shared that information looking at that soybean defoliation, we're seeing a 35% increase in the accuracy for soybean defoliation thresholds. This is actually correlating to a potential 15% reduction in insecticide uses in those cases. And when we look at that spotted lanternfly egg mass hunt, after those stakeholders participated in that event, 100% of them left knowing what an adult looked like, 95% of them knew what a SLF egg mass was, and 86% knew some of the signs and symptoms. So our vision is to build an entomological community with 3D printing. With this support, what we would like to do is host a library where anybody can deposit any type of print, any type of electronic design file that we can freely download, and we can be kind of the replicators. If you have access to 3D printers, we can give you the soybean defoliation. You can print it, you can do that on extension, right? We can do this SLF, anything, just to share sort of like a bug, word, a bug wood for pictures, only this is for 3D printing, and that's what we'd like to do. Thank you. We will start with the judges' questions. Once you, once you create the library, how, how do you ensure that it um, is kept up to date? And, and maintained over time. So one of the things that we've been in communications with is, is um, the Crop Protection Network. They're interested in potentially serving as a host for this. And so they can even add a DOI identifier on these prints. So if anybody else brings prints there, we can upload that. And with this money, we're in con uh, um, negotiations with them to see if they'd be willing to host it and serve it for a long time. Other times, I mean, we can, we can have our own websites, but that's, that's kind of the library that we're kind of uh, looking at and kind of have that for, you know, p prosperity. Who, who you consider to be a potential customer? Customer. Well, I mean, I think for this product, it's not necessarily selling, although we can sell them for, for, for customers that want them. We have the capability to produce them. But really, in our labs, we have three 3D printers. We can't keep, with, keep up with all the demand. So the customers are our extension educators, are public officials that want more information or want information, unique information, to give to their stakeholders. But you're not thinking of making money? How many of you are in extension? <laughs> How many of you make money? <laughs> yeah, no, but we're interested in helping solve these problems, right? Defoliation occurs nationwide. SLF is really marching, and so we need these tools. So if we give you $5,000, basically we should expect a $5,000 going to dark hall. Well, Ashley mentioned it. <laughs> yep, so there's different ways that we can take this, right? So what we actually have done is sold some of these, and we have made a profit. So there is the capacity here to make money off of some of these products. And the nice thing is that we can build this library, and you can imagine, as that, multi as that library multiplies, those funds could also potentially um, mul uh, multiply as well. But the idea is that we really want it to go towards education. We want to make sure that we're spreading whatever education is associated with these given tools. Ashley mentioned the 15% potential reduction in insecticide use. That was just in Ohio. I mean, these things, the, our soybean th printed leaf, the three leaves that we print are cheaper than this small little tag that we have to source out. But, but can you also think about maybe you can sell some of them to extension agent who can do use them for education purpose or chemical company who sell 
pesticide or herbicide as the free handout for their customer, but you can sell them to the kind of recruit we can about. we can do that. We can license that too yeah. as well. But in extension, where our business is just creating information and not necessarily making money on this, right? Yeah. Okay. What other crops or crop damage uh, have you guys prototyped other than the soybeans? Uh, um, so I'm the one who did the beetle butt card, and that's because I have a lot of growers that get out into their cucurbit fields and they struggle with identifying the different beetles they're confronted with because they all look very similar, but they don't all pose the same threat. And so I think the way that we've looked at some of these problems is to understand that there are some massive similarities across different crops. While we're talking about field crops, we could talk about specialty crops um, or forest pests, like what was shown here with uh, the new... Um, invasive. So I have experience working in specialty crops and different types of tools that we're using um, in terms of identifying some of those specialty crop pests. So far, I think any problem that we've had, we've been able to come up with a model for. So I think it's, it, it's the, the usage is, is quite widespread. And I know we're, and most of us are entomologists, but we're working on plant pathology too. I have a plant pathologist colleague that wants to create kind of like a Swiss army knife of soybean diseases so that you can get that to growers and they can quickly look at it from there. Good. We will um, start with some audience questions. Um, what, uh, or are you worried about plastic pollution with search and find use in the field? So that's a, that's a good question. And we thought about this because there's many different types of plastic filaments you can use. The one that we always use for everything that we're handing out is PLA, plastic, and it's polylactic acid. So it's from a natural source. It's not petroleum-based sources. And it, it is, quote, unquote, biodegradable. We've looked into it. It's more biodegradable than others, um, but that's the best kind of natural plastic we, we can and we use, and so everything that we use is all PLA. We also, when we put these egg hunts out, we also try uh, to recollect them. And actually what we do is when we put them out, we take pictures, and so when we, part of the survey, what we do is we get real-time data. So when Ashley will go out, she'll put a, a egg masses high, medium, and low. The, the audience members submit pictures, and we'll be able to see which ones they, 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 they pick. And we can see, well, they're missing all the low ones, so we can shift our programming to make sure we're, we're telling them to look at the low ones. There are already free 3D libraries. What's the advantage of making your own instead of using one of the existing ones? So I think... There are free 3D libraries. I think for us, I mean, I couldn't really find anything entomologically related. And so this is gonna be a quicker stop for all of us in the entomology community to find maybe what we're looking for. A lot of us are dealing with the common pest. I mean, soybean defoliation occurs all over where soybeans grown. SLF, I mean, how many people are concerned about SLF? Somebody told me it was found in Chicago today. So, I mean, it's spreading. So I think this will be a much easier depository to put these, these 3D prints. Um, what are the costs for hosting a library, and what are the upkeep costs? So I think um, that's a good question. Right now, with the crop production network, I mean, there might be an initial fee to, 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 to host the library and that. But if we're looking at established networks like that, we can hopefully, you know, that's going to be there. It's more like a journal repository, and that's going to provide some permanence on that, too. We can potentially look at sales and, and you'll look at upkeep that way, too. Well, another that we've been able to, what we've been able to do is, is uh, we've been able to get some funding from the North Central IPM Center that's really started this going. Our Soybean Council is really interested in this. So that's some way that we can kind of build some funding capacity for these extension deliverables. Uh, are these models available for reproduction as files, or is this merely the distribution of 3D printed goods? So I think it's both. Um, we can distribute them, but we only have three printers in our lab, but we can also deliver the files. There's usually, they're called STL files, and theoretically, it's just like a Word doc that if we send you that STL file, you should be able to, to use any type of printer and print, print, print the, the designs. Maybe as a follow-up question, um, you could, well, it was a, maybe a suggestion more than a question. I don't know if you would consider charging a fee for outside entities to access your prints. We do, we have done that. Again, I mean, we'd happy to share the print, but if you want us to make it, we have limited capacity to do that as well, yeah. 
Just a few seconds left. Is there any follow-ups from the judge, judges? Okay. Thank you guys very much. We're Thank you. You feel, do what you like, yeah. Keep dancing on that long. Come on and keep on dancing. Please welcome to the stage Emma Jonas and Amal Yazdi from the University of Delaware, presenting the Blue Engineers. Testing. Sounds pretty good. I'll test it. All right, hi everybody. Um, so we're presenting the Angler. The Blue Engineers was our team name. Um, and the Angler is what you see right now. So we might look weird alien-like, maybe even scary? Or do we have useful adaptations that lead to unique and interesting ornamentation? <laughs> so our product, the Angler, as a lot of you guys can attest to in this room, someone's worst nightmare from their most grotesque dream could be someone else's favorite insect or favorite animal. So our product, the Angler, is inspired by one of the most beautiful creatures in all of nature, um, the anglerfish. <laughs> so without further ado. So traditional macro photography cameras are expensive and bulky, which reduces macro photography accessibility. Um, you know, they're often 
uh, burdensome to carry out into the field. And so thankfully there are small macro lenses you can attach uh, to your phone that are relatively inexpensive. So these macro lenses are super effective. They're a very popular choice and they are very effective for daytime photography. However, for evening insect macro photography, there are still a lot of challenges that are presented if you wanted to use a macro lens on your phone or one of these attachable ones. So lighting is always the main issue. Uh, a traditional headlamp coming directly from your forehead is blocked by your phone or whatever camera you're using. And so here I am taking a picture of a micro moth uh, with a traditional headlamp and my macro lens. And this is the resulting photo. So it casts a shadow um, because of the angle of my headlamp. So I spend a lot of time at a insect sheet at night because I know I can get high quality pictures with limited equipment and budget, uh, but much of that time is spent trying to uh, perfect the balancing act of holding my headlamp at the correct angle uh, because the smaller the subject, the more light you need. Um, and so I spend a lot of time doing this and to uh, efficiently adjust my lighting will save me a lot of time and allow me to observe more insects. So that's where our product comes in. The angler is set to revolutionize insect photography at night. And with its innovative new design, it allows us to use precise lighting control. So similar to the symbiotic bacteria that allow for the angler to produce light, our product is set to create more efficient photography and lighting for entomologists. So this is an indispensable tool for the field because of our 3D printed gooseneck support on the forehead here, which supports a uh, high lumen, high intensity light. Um, and the weight of the light is offset by a long lasting battery in the back. Um, and there's three different light settings uh, to save battery. And also there will be a clip in the final product that allows you to turn it into a traditional headlamp for hiking in and out. So with the help of ESA, um, we would like to combine the two prototypes you see today uh, to have a headlamp that has all the features one could desire. And we will end up with a low cost model, uh, more accessible uh, to students, and then a durable long lasting model, uh, which will be $150 compared to 50 is the goal. So as you guys can see from these images, these photos are taken, they're a macro photos taken at insect lights with the support of the use of Angler. So there's a lot more details present, the photos are a lot more clear, which allows for researchers on platforms like iNaturalist to make more quality and specific identifications on these insects, which are severely underrepresented in terms of insect photography. So insect photography at night is really pivotal and higher quality photos results in higher quality data and these data can be then used in research. So uh, the ability to move the light independently of the camera is really important. So current uh, lights on the market attach directly to the phone. And so when you change the focus of your uh, image, it's changing the lighting and the angle of the light. So, um, and vice versa. So you wanna be able to move them independently. Ultimately, we wanna increase the comfort for all entomologists at lights. So we want to reduce the number of insects that are flying away when you are adjusting your lighting in your phone, which is a typical problem. You're standing there, you can use a flashlight or move your headlamp around with your hand, but the insects end up flying away and you have low levels of success often. And also a nice side effect that we learned is that insects fly in your face a lot less because the light is farther away from your face. So you end up having less insects and overall improved quality of your photos. So this is the face of a person who has taken a high quality picture of a small picture wing fly on the first try. Um, Thank you so much for listening today. If you have any unique uses for this equipment um, that don't have to do with this unique uh, or very specific entomological dilemma that we talked about today, we're happy to hear and we're happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. And now we'll start questioning from the judges. You guys look fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. My question is, you guys showed a picture of a stationary light on the individual phone already. 
you guys are mounting the angler on your heads. Why not mount the angler on the head of your phone and adjust that way? Yeah, good question. So uh, the problem is specifically with the macro lens that's on your phone, you have to move kind of forward and back to uh, s specifically for small specimens have the perfect amount of um, focus. And so if you're changing the focus, whether it's uh, an angler or not, if it's attached to the phone, you're also changing where the light is. So you want to change one at a time, essentially, in order for it to be quick. I'm not super handy, but I think after seeing what you've done, I, I might be able to make one myself. So what, what uh, advantage do you see in what you're developing over what somebody like me could make at home? Well, ultimately, the angler would replace whatever head headlamp that you're currently using and would streamline all of the tools that you would need as an entomologist in terms of lighting for photography. So this product is um, designed to supplement whatever tools you have, whatever camera you currently have. And because it could fold back in our final model and be used as a regular headlamp, then it's not going to add additional equipment that you would have to carry. It's an elevated version of something that already exists. And with the considerations that we're going into, being people that work in the field, we're going to ensure that we're picking light materials, quality materials, batteries that last, making it you know, as good as and then better than what's currently on the market. So one problem is uh, if you've done the macro photography yourself, one of the problem is the shadow. If the, the light source comes from one direction, it creates a shadow somewhere. Mm -hmm. And in the small object, you don't even know the, what, which, which is the shadow, which is an object. So how do you solve that problem with just source coming from one, one, one direction? So um, specifically with the ring light design, you're able to turn it and place it over the macro lens so that it is coming from, uh, it's surrounding the entire lens that you're taking the picture with. It's hard to demonstrate without my phone, but you would essentially turn it around um, and put it inside. Um, so it is coming around the camera itself if you use it that way. Um, and I think the key there is bright light. Uh, I, without being a professional photographer and doing it more so as a hobbyist in order to uh, see more uh, insects and upload more to iNaturalist, um, I am getting quality enough photos uh, with my limited equipment and that's what really excites me. Um, and I think that the angler will progress over time to uh, adapt, you know, different types of the different heat of the lighting. I talked to someone today about that to create more artistic uh, photos that maybe would be used in a professional setting rather than just on iNaturalist. All right, uh, we have questions coming in online. I don't know if we have the QR code or not, but most people I think have, have entered them. We'll start with a few of these. Um, what are some alternative markets outside of entomology? So this is a great question and one that has answered has been answered by all of you today, actually, as we've been meeting and discussing with you. Some of the ones that we thought about were working in homes, carpentry, mechanic work, crafting. Um, any other field work, we met with someone who does bird research and needs to be able to get a dramatic difference in angle of where they're looking, and a standard headlamp just doesn't offer enough of a range of where the light is being cast. So that's another application. Yeah, just to elaborate, uh, bird spotlighting, uh, specifically with owl surveys, you can angle it to quickly identify an owl or the owl's age. You know, maybe you hear the call so you know what owl it is, but you can look closely at their feathers if they're quickly flying by. Um, also in uh, minor medical surgeries, so rather than carrying over a giant uh, rolling light it, in order to stitch or uh, remove a sliver, uh, it could also be applied to that. I think you addressed a little bit about there being some similar things on the market, but a question surrounding that and um, how would the price compare or the value differ? 
so the two different options, the, the $50 option is, uh, rel is cheap uh, compared to some headlamps currently on the market. Uh, so we're, we're just wanting to increase accessibility with that option. Um, and then the 150 is about what you would find in a very high quality headlamp currently on the market. Um, and we want to include all the features that are useful in this very uh, specific setting. And so uh, I hope we covered them um, and we're really open to including more uh, as they come up. Does the bright light include a bias while collecting insects at night? Can you re or yeah, repeat? So that. yeah, Sorry. does the type of light or the brightness of the light um, impart a bias when collecting insects at night? Definitely. So different kinds of light offer different things. Some insects are very sensitive to certain kinds of light, so it's important to use red light and other forms of light. So we do want to have adjustable light settings. This one does have adjustable light settings, but we definitely want there to be more variation and more specialized settings for entomology related purposes. So in our final prototype, we'll have a little bit more leeway with flexibility in terms of selecting our light settings. And I think that question was kind of getting off of what light you were using to attract the insects specifically. Um, yeah, so UV versus mercury vapor lamps will also attract a slightly different assemblage of insects. So you, you have to take that into account when you're look, what species you're targeting, yeah. Uh, question of what kind of battery does it use? So currently, um, uh, this one uses, or sorry, a MALS uses AAA batteries. Uh, we want to replace that with a lithium battery um, that will be longer lasting and rechargeable. Uh, we want this to be able to work for extended stays in the field where you maybe won't be able to recharge it in a few days. Um, and uh, funding will help us uh, build upon uh, what we currently have um, in order to have a stronger light while making it rechargeable. Maybe last question, what's the difference between the two prototypes right now? You mentioned combining them. This is prototype one, and that is prototype two we're still working on. Prototype two is a little bit sleeker in terms of how we streamline the design, so it's uniform in color, it's a little bit more consistent in terms of the look of the design. I think prototype one is more comfortable, so in our final prototype we definitely plan to combine them but some differences are the structures that we use, the 3D printed structures are an added to the second prototype, as well as the way that we added um, some of the other fastens to the products and how they fit mostly. Yeah, so the, the extra support that we 3D printed for this one, uh, we have a sturdier gooseneck here, and that will uh, become handy when we have a high lumen light um, that is light enough to put at the end of this, and that is what we will be doing in the future. Any follow-ups from the judges needed? No? Okay, thank you, we are at time. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone.
Please welcome to the stage, Seungyun Lee from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, presenting WET, Water Exclusion Trap. Hi. Oh, okay. So let me start. Uh, I'm Seungyun Lee, presenting WET, the Water Exclusion Trap. So I'm a beetle systematist, and I'm fascinated by their diversity. And so collecting beetles is my lifelong passion, and also it's a very fundamental process in my study. Among many collecting methods, window trap is one of the most effective way to collect beetles. So how it works, flying beetles collide to the transparent panel here and fall down to the bottom collector filled with preservation medium. So. I collect so many beetles using this trap, and I extracted DNA from my research and ran PCR and electrophoresis, and this is what happened. Zero band was observed. So why does it happen? Because DNA get degraded because of the water intrusion. Uh, rain and dewdrop and time uh, mixed all together and dilute the medium very badly. So whenever I collect uh, samples from this trap, it smells really bad like a rotten fish, and you will never get uh, high-quality DNA from these samples. The problem is that DNA gets more important. Back in the 1960s, I'm a beetle uh, molecular systematist. All the people use morphological data. They are happy with that rotten beetles with morphology preserved. But now we all use DNA for building phylogeny. But it's weird that we are using that same like 60-year-old trap that messes up all the DNA quality. So yeah, I decided to invent the new trap, and this is our first design. And yeah, yeah, definitely needs some improvement. So I improved that with like elementary school mathematics here, and then I made proto prototype, and this is our final design, and we call it wet water exclusion trap. So what I invented is basically a bottom collector. The upper part is the same as a traditional one, and bottom part is what I invented. So how it works, it's like a built-in pitfall trap in the bottom collector. So water fall down through the mesh, and beetles get caught by that mesh, crawl around inside because they are beetles, and they eventually fall down to the pure medium. So no water, just pure medium and beetles. So in this way, we can preserve DNA better. So I printed out this trap with 3D printers, and, and yeah, here's the product here. And we conducted field test, and yeah, you can see the difference right away. So same day, so, so same day interval, same place, but different results. Also, samples collected by this trap uh, showed higher PCR success rate, and they had higher DNA integrity. So we truly believe that this trap will bring us a better quality DNA so that we can do better research, such as molecular phylogenetics, genetics, population genetics, and other researches. And this trap will be more effective in rainy areas like tropical rainforests where we need more study. Okay? And another uh, important feature of this trap is uh, we can adopt this principle to any other type of, type of trap, for example, pitfall trap. Yeah, so we can adapt this to other type of traps. And we almost finished patent in South Korea and China, and we are looking for other countries. And also, this trap was published recently in the journal. So when you go to the journal, you, there is a 3D printing template, so you can download it. If you have 3D printer, just print it. You can use it. But here's the thing. I thought 3D printing is kind of common here, but in developing country, they don't have 3D printers. So I got many requests of ready-made product for commercial products. So that is why I'm here, to promote this trap to you and find someone who are interested in mass production. Okay? Of course, I'm here to win that $5,000 cash prize. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good amount of cash prize, but it's not enough for running any business. You know? So I will use all that money, if granted, to find sponsors, suppliers, manufacturers who are interested in mass production. So before I finish, what I made is a simply designed DNA preservation trap. And we call it wet. It, it blocks the water from the trap. So if you see the value and potential of this trap, and if you think it's, uh, if you think more entomologists in the field biology need this trap. So please make me the first place. And 
help me bring this product to the market. Thank you. Great job. We're right at time, so we will start the judges' questions now. So uh, it seems like the people who like, use this product is kind of specialized people segment of it. So how big is your, is your market you're foreseeing? Who, who are you using like this? Okay, so let's have a quick survey. Raise your hand if you don't want this trap. So. <laughs> okay, there's someone. Yeah, I know it's psychology. It's a psychology yeah. trick. But uh, frankly, I think all the universities, museums, all institutions who do this kind of field research is potential uh, customer of this trap. For example, uh, in my institute, uh, I mean, uh, I'm now in Chinese Academy of Science. We have collaborate project with uh, Natural History Museum London. We are building hundred uh, collection sites across the world, like we hope. Yes. So we use like ten window trap and hundred pitfall trap in each site. So that means like you multiply one hundred to that number. We solely need like ten thousand pitfall or window traps solely on that project. So I think there are many similar projects across the world and. Yeah, there, there should be some demand. Also, this trap uh, preserves DNA better, but also preserve morphology better, because they don't decay. So I think amateur entomologists or enthusiasts, also they want this trap, if, if this trap goes to the market. Hmm. Yes. Okay. I have a couple of questions. One on um, price point. Did you mention what you, what you think a marketable price point is? Okay, uh, so there's two kind of price point because you have a 3D printing device, it's free. I mean, there's a template. You can just download the template and print out if you have 3D printers, so that is basically free. But uh, nothing is decided yet for mass production. So we have to think about like, like how to make this, like materials, all the things are not fixed. So I can't tell you the exact uh, price, but I'll, I'll say that I'll try my best to lower the price because uh, what I want to do with this trap is just people use better trap in affordable price. So I think less than like $30 are or so is kind of what I am thinking of, So, but not decided yet. Have you considered integrating this trap with other trapping methods such as putting it at the bottom of a malaise trap or something of that nature? where you can collect things in both directions, stuff that flies up and down. Uh, yes, of course, because uh, I think uh, the pitfall trap is kind of that one, right? When we pit put the pitfall, pitfall, pitfall trap down in the malaise trap, uh, the panel, that, that'll work. So yeah, why not? Yeah, that'll work. Another question. Um I didn't see, did you do a comparative analysis to make sure that there's nothing about this trap that is accidentally excluding any insects? So I think, uh, you mean the number of insects or something like that, sure. right? Yeah. yeah, so to make sure so that you're not yes, getting yes. a smaller number. So the number of insects trap. collected by these window trap or all the flight intercept trap is proportional to the size of the panel. Not, not like, it, all, the, all the things collide to the panel will eventually go down and will be collected. So so the number of insects is only proportional to the size of the panel. So we, we can get all the things if so that no lights and escape things. mechanism that you've accidentally built into it. Oh sorry? There's no there's no escape mechanism that you've accidentally that would make it possible for an insect to escape. No, but all okay. the insects will come down to the bottom collector. So okay. I have one more question. You're collecting into ethanol at the Okay, uh, any kind of uh, liquid medium can be used. Like I use like ethanol and we have that DESS. Yeah, and both works well. And uh, those liquids, do they react with the plastic? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. But we have to uh, think about the material later, I think. Okay. If that decays the things or not. Yes. But, but in this case, no, I don't think so. Yes. Some of those liquids in the sunlight, potentially with the plastic, might cause brittle uh, plastic with the, its PLA. Yeah, possibly, but yeah. In, in our field test, it, 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 it does it well. Out, yeah, 
that it works well. Good deal. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, what is the environmental durability of the 3D printed, printed plastic or UV and heat? Do you have any idea of its life? Oh. I don't actually know, but I, I can only say that there was no problem when we used that in the field in South Korea, in rainy and hot season, so I don't think there is a problem. So that's what I can answer. Uh, let me see, I lost my place a little. Okay, um, this may be related to Michelle's question, but um, how do you ensure the beetles fall into the medium and not just crawl out, or did you do anything to look at escape from the mesh compared to a conventional trap? Okay, so here's the thing. So, actually there will be some missing point because here's a mesh. This mesh uh, determines the minimum size of the beetle collected because if beetle is smaller than this small fine mesh, they will fall down through this mesh. But so if you are targeting a small insect, you can use finer mesh. Yeah, so that, that's, that's the thing. Okay. Um, how long can the trap be set before the, I, th I think they said ethanol, but whatever the collection medium is, evaporates? So it depends on like what kind of quality DNA you you need. So if you are looking for some like NGS things or like hi-fi sequencing, you have to go to your trap very frequently. But if you are only concerning about like CO on thing, then you can leave it like 60, 70 days. It's okay, I think so. Is it possible to use RNA later or other solutions? Oh, actually, I I tried to use RNA later, but it's it's very expensive, first of all, and some beetles not get uh, not like drawn to the RNA later, but they just float on the RNA later, and that doesn't work in some time. So yeah, I prefer using ethanol or DESS. I think DESS is the best liquid when using this trap. Um, this may or may not relate to potentially a misunderstanding about if any additional liquid can get in there. But it, the question was, can the water, it says, but I would assume the fluid, from the inner chamber overflow oh. into the chamber with the beetles? Yes, yes, it's possible. But, okay. uh, I mean, if so many beetles get inside that trap, it'll be like overflow, right? But still, that is way better than the traditional trap. That's, that's, what, that's the key point here. And you advertise this product as modular with other trap types. How would uh, how would you accomplish this? How is this accomplished? Uh, can you explain it again? So I, 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 get, uh, I didn't get it. Maybe changing it um, to like a pitfall trap or something, or it's modular that you can. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, made of uh, com different components or parts that could. Um, be removed or added to make it functional uh, okay. in a different uh, The 3D printing template is provided online, so you can just download it and you can just uh, modify that however you want. So, yes, is that, I think so. it can be the answer? Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, and uh, are there any other follow-up questions from the judges? Okay, we are at time. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now um, that was our last presentation, so we come to a little bit of time for the judges to deliberate and review all of the projects. Please stay here, we will announce a winner today. So hang out, chat, maybe find uh, the inventors that just presented if you have additional questions that didn't get answered. Thank you all very much for submitting questions on Slido. We really appreciate the interaction and the curiosity of the audience. So be just a few minutes and we'll announce the winner.
No fighting. We got the refugees. No fighting. No fighting. Shakira, Shakira. I never really knew that she could dance like this. Hey. She make a man want to speak Spanish. Como se llama? Hey. Bonita. Hey. Casa. Shakira, Casa. Shakira. Oh, baby, when you talk like that, you make a woman go mad. Hey. So be wise hey. and keep Okay, we're ready to announce uh, the winning team. And uh, just uh, before I do, just want to thank all the teams again, everyone who submitted and the six finalists who presented. Uh, just amazing ideas, very, very exciting. And this is what we wanted. We wanted to create kind of this innovation culture um, amongst, among our members and feel like, uh, provide a space for really creative thought and I think we we saw that for sure so um, so I'd like first let's let's thank again all the teams who presented today I'd also like to I neglected in my opening uh, remarks to to thank our current president uh, President M and um, and I, I didn't mention that in our inaugural event in 2019 she was the organizer of uh, Antlion Pit and carried that out. And I appreciate, we all appreciate her support of this again for her meeting as president in, in, at Entomology 2023. So, so thank you, Em, if you're still here. If not, let's give Emma, President Em a round of applause. And uh, also I wanna or, uh, recognize uh, my, my co-organizer who, who did all the work today, <laughs> um, uh, Patty Prasifka. Let's thank Patty. And I would like to thank our three judges again. Let's thank our judges for uh, for their work, their hard work. Okay, and the judges uh, wanted definitely me to mention, and this is not hard. Uh, this is definitely something that was was apparent when we have these presentations is that, um, that, that it was very close, that they had a hard time uh, picking a winner and uh, it differentiating because these are such great, great ideas. But we can only do one winner. And, um, and when I announce that, the, the winning team come up. I'll present you with your trophy or your prize. And, um, 
the, the check is in the mail, as, as I've been told. <laughs> so you will, receive the, you will receive your check. So uh, for Antlion Pit Competition and Entomology 2023, um, the winner today is Insect Eavesdroppers. So, so co come on up and we'll get some pictures. And thank you all again for um, attending this, and hopefully we can keep this going into the future. So let's thank everyone again for all the, all the help. <laughs>